So it's such a pleasure to be, um, I suppose, closing day one at this 10-year celebration of service design. And it's been even more of a pleasure to spend the day listening to some absolutely amazing talks. And it was so great to hear that lots and lots of people were talking about systems thinking, about collaborating at scale. And when I was listening to them, I was like, oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm going to say that in my talk. So hopefully, this will be a little bit of a uh, summary and a reinforcement of all of those um, good talks before. So I just want to see who here has done a, any work on homelessness? OK, about 3% of the audience, I'd say. Um, if you have, and even if you haven't, you'll know that homelessness is a big problem. So you can see from this graph, while it's gone down, it's going back up in England. In England last year, local government had to provide housing to 56,000 homeless families and vulnerable people. And that had gone up by 35% in the last uh, five years. And because we don't have much social housing left in the UK, quite often they have to put people into temporary accommodation, which is not great standards. It's temporary. People can't move on with their lives. And it costs a lot of money. And for other people who might be not deemed as vulnerable or people who have made themselves intentionally homeless, i.e. they haven't taken the house that the uh, local government has given them, they're left to fend for themselves in B&Bs and hostels. And then there's rough sleepers, people that we might instinctively think of as homeless, people who we might see on the street every day. And their numbers, again, are going up from a small amount, but quite dramatically, 135% in the last five years. And it's not evenly spread around the country, but in places like London, one in 50 people are homeless. It's a huge amount. And it's not going to get any better. Um, at the moment, we think collectively in the UK, there's about a quarter of a million people who are homeless. And that's going to go up to half a million by 2050. So the data is stark in England, and I'm sure it's dark in countries where you live. But what's starker is the stories. So the one we've been doing at uh, Policy Lab, which is an innovation team within the government where I used to work as a founding member, and now at UsCreate, a service design agency. We've been doing lots and lots of user research with homeless people in a variety of different situations, people who are rough sleeping on the street, people who are single men living in hostels, families living in temporary accommodation. And we've heard the most harrowing stories, but the one that struck me most was Ella. So Ella, um, she was kicked out of her house by her stepdad. She went and moved and into the caravan with her boyfriend in the garden of her boyfriend's mum's house. She was kicked out of there when she broke up with her boyfriend because he'd found someone else. And kind of luckily, she is being now housed by the local government because her sister, who's got learning difficulties, has also been chucked out by her stepdad. They've been found some accommodation, but it's not a flat, it's not an apartment, it's a travel lodge. And when we were there, the cleaners kept on coming in and out of her room all the time. She had absolutely no privacy. She hasn't got a bank account, she's never opened one up. Her benefits are still being paid into her ex-boyfriend's bank. Uh, her mum never stands up for her. And it's her, her ex's mum who she now considers to be her rock. But out of all of that, <laughs> The thing that got me most, made me choke, was this. So that's Ella's fridge. And as you can see, I mean, how, how on earth could you even imagine planning your way out of homelessness to get a job, to get a more permanent place, to make a plan when you can only have enough space to have milk for the day? And so, like, Ella, like many of the other people we saw, um, displayed personal risk factors and resilience factors. So resilience factors like a strong support network, a positive outlook on life, resourcefulness, going and staying with friends and families, uh, buying a rug for their hostel just to keep a sense of self. But also lots of personal risk factors, so hanging out with the wrong type of people, uh, doing drugs to cope with some quite harrowing uh, situations, not being financially literate like Ella. 
We also, over the last three years, have spoken to lots of people who work in local government who've been delivering services, people like Maggie. So Maggie is faced with like an impossible situation. She has got no affordable housing to give to people in Oxford. And so she has to go above and beyond her job every single day. So she has to um, hold off the landlord when they're trying to evict them, trying to buy time for her clients to find alternative accommodation, often very far from Oxford. She has to help them fill out very, very complicated forms when they come in. She acts as their coach, their mentor, their negotiator, their rock. And there's lots of other people working in government who are feeling overwhelmed. So services are overwhelmed. Um, there's lots and lots of missed opportunities to spot people who are at risk much earlier, probably by different parts of the local government, by doctors, by schools. There are lots of concerns about people just following process, making sure that because they want to abide by the law, they're following uh, all the rules and regulations exactly, rather than actually just spending a little bit of time listening to people and helping them prevent homelessness. But that's all well and good, and we found lots and lots of opportunities when we were doing this work to redesign the local government service, and in fact change the behaviours of the people using those services and people delivering them. But homelessness, as you'll all know, can't just be solved by a really good local government service. I wish that was the case. It's incredibly complex. The backstories of all the people that we spoke to um, showed us various different deep-rooted causes um, the data science revealed risk factors like truanting at school or being in care. And the many, many experts we talked to across the system pointed to big structural problems like, well, there's no actual affordable housing, gentrification is meaning that rent is going up, that we're cutting welfare benefits. And so this is so complex, I thought I'd better map it. And I was reminded, actually, this time last year, Bridgeable did a really lovely talk at the last conference in Amsterdam about how maps help you navigate the world and help you find where you're in. So I mapped it, and I don't think you can see it uh, very clearly, because it's quite complex, but basically over in the yellow section, you've got multiple complex needs. So these are people who've gone through childhood trauma, who've developed mental health issues, who then might have got um, problems with drugs and alcohol, who might have become violent, who've gone to prison, who then um, are in a revolving cycle of homelessness. You've got the kind of the turquoise section. These are things about people's expectations of getting a social house, about their expectations of relationships and how they might live together in families. The green section over here, this is all about income. Uh, unstable economy, which we have in the UK at the moment, um, is leading to an unstable job market, uh, low zero-hour contracts, very unstable work, unemployment, and people's benefits are being cut as well. In the red section, lots of stuff around housing. We don't have enough social housing in the UK anymore, which has driven up demand for people living in the private rented sector, which has driven up prices, which has led to unscrupulous landlords. And the blue section, that's what I was talking about before. That is the work of the local government office and the cultures and the processes and the services that go on there. <laughs> so that feels pretty overwhelming, doesn't it? Um, but I think it's really important for us as service designers, when we're working away in one bit of the system, to be able to understand what the rest of the system looks like. And it might help us figure out where are the reinforcing loops, where might we want to go and do a project next. And if we can't do it all ourselves, because that is quite a lot, then we can collaborate with others and we can become bigger than the sum of our parts. So, over the last uh, three years, I've been doing a lot of work on homelessness, and I wanted to start mapping where design is at work across the system, and I'm going to take you through some examples now. So the first is um, we have to work at different levels of the system. So I think um, in an earlier talk, we, um, we were talking about scaling up. So when I was at Policy Lab, which is in the Cabinet Office in, in the UK government, uh, I led a project there, which was the very start of this work. 
We did a lot of uh, ethnography, we did some data science, we understood the uh, situation, but we co-designed a new blueprint for what a local service, lo a local government housing service could look like. And obviously the blueprint is not the deliverable, we've heard that earlier. Um, but what we were able to do is we were able to create some prototypes out of that and then share those as part of a £40 million fund that the Prime Minister announced to give to 30 councils to experiment with those prototypes to take them on. So we were kind of creating a pattern which then others could develop and scale. But the other thing, we were supported by the Homelessness Reduction Act, which is a new piece of legislation which has just come into force. And there it says that everyone has to have a plan. And that was part of our blueprint. Our blueprint was for a service where people were identified really, really early through a number of different channels, through data science, predictive modeling, through self-referrals, and through partners like doctors and schools. And then the service was a very empathetic coaching service where people were asked to create a plan, which you can see in legislation. So that's national government. And now in us creates have been working with five councils, five local government areas in the UK to start implementing some of those prototypes. And this is a, a photo of a council in London called Lewisham. Um, they've been an absolute joy to work with. But here they are really redesigning what the experience of going into the housing options, uh, the housing, um, government housing office looks like. So rather than walking in, and quite often you have a glass pane in front of you and the local government worker for health and safety, um, rather than that, they've been experimenting with sitting down next to each other on comfortable chairs, and for the first 15 minutes, rather than filling out a form saying all the risk factors, all the things that they can't do, just listening. Just taking a moment to realize that these people are in crisis, and they just might want someone to hear what their situation is. And it's been amazing to see the transformation um, among the staff. We were down the other week and we heard from Maureen and Jane who had said that they had been role-playing this in their lunch break and they had figured out that the chairs that they get uh, the, uh, um, the client and the housing officer to sit on are completely different heights and the client is often sitting really down low and that doesn't feel very empowering. So they've changed all the chairs, which is great. So we was, we've been supporting local councils, local government, really change the culture of their staff from being gatekeepers who just kind of process uh, applications for homelessness into problem solvers, into coaches. But it's not always, the, the solutions might not always actually lie even within local government. They might lie at the community level. So in another local area, this isn't an advance, but actually you could see that this is the local uh, prevention building. So this is a, a cafe, and without having to even go anywhere near the council, this is where people are going to get advice about evictions, about benefits, about housing. This is where they're going to find their new landlord, their new flat, if they're getting evicted. So the question for us here is how can we really support these community hubs to do the work that we need them to do. So, working at different levels of the system. The second one is we have to think about different stages of prevention in the system. If we're really going to be serious about preventing homelessness, we need to start really early on. It's not good enough to, for us to wait until someone is actually threatened with eviction. And I wanted to show three examples of how design is at work already. So this is a wonderful organization called Settle. Um, they, are, they identify young people who are leaving care, who we know are likely to become homeless, and they work with them on a six-week program to really support them to uh, work out how to live independently for the first time, how to budget, how to cook meals, etc. Um, a bit nearer, we've got Ally, which is a chatbot, which has been designed with single men living in hostels who are at risk, potentially, of losing their place there. Um, and that it's a chatbot that gives them access to services around eviction, again, and employment rights. And then finally, when people are really 
um, still when they are actually homeless. Um, access to healthcare is a real, real problem. And because often homeless people don't have an address, they end up going to A&E, which is quite expensive. So Pathways is a um, healthcare charity for homeless people, and they have co-designed a service full of medical professionals, so doctors, nurses, uh, to make sure that homeless people get access to the right service. And there they've seen um, a reduction in the amount of time that uh, homeless people have to spend in, in hospital beds and stop them coming back. So, design at work at various different prevention stages of the system. It's at work in different places of the system as well. I should have um, included the key here, but you've got things like in Newcastle, in the north of England, we're working with their housing, uh, the government housing team, to include debt management and uh, income support in there, because we know that actually making sure people have got enough money is really, really critical to this. Um, Policy Lab has continued its work with SNUC um, on homelessness, and, but it's been focusing now on the experience of the private rented sector, setting out um, expectations, uh, setting out ways that tenants can really reassure their landlords that they are going to be good tenants, how they can set out the good roles and responsibilities of both sides. Um, Serenians is a great service in Scotland which uh, looks at how they can support people across a variety of their issues, including family mediation. Uh, With the Grain is a service in Ealing, again, a council in London, which has used behaviour change methodology to refocus how people are asking for housing, not so much expecting social housing when there isn't any, but seeing how they can find the ho a house that they can afford. And then finally, over the summer, we've been working with BBC Radio 4 in the UK to put on a series of design uh, radio programmes where we're using service design techniques to come up with ideas for tricky social issues. And we did one about affordable housing and came up with some really provocative ideas around um, capping the amount that you can sell your house for, using open data to make it possible to design a home on your phone or build a home on your phone, and thinking about employer cooperatives who can come together and build houses. In systems thinking, it's really also important, as well as thinking about the individual elements in the system, to think about the relationships between things, thinking about the values that are imbued in our systems. And societal expectations is a big, prob a big issue um, in the local areas that we're working in. There is a long engendered um, expectation in the UK that you will be able to get social housing and that you will be able to stay in the local area that you've grown up with, in, even though prices are rising. Now, I wish this wasn't the case, but it is. So we've been doing a lot of work in Southwark where we've been trying to redesign their services so they have the discussion material where they can start to manage those expectations with the clients right from the start, setting out the amount of benefits that they've got in a local area and what the average rental price is for a flat. And they often don't match. And the, the, we've seen that staff there have been able to have much more positive discussions about housing, and people have um, realised they've had to go away and find house in the private sector. And then another one is around focusing on reinforcing loops. So there are, when you map the system, you can often see these kind of revolving doors where things are just getting worse and worse and worse, like I showed you up in the yellow section. And stigma is a real problem in homelessness. So it's very, very difficult for homeless people to get a job or to get um, uh, into a flat quite often because they don't have an address. And if they're in a homeless hostel, they can give them an address, but then it clearly marks them as a homeless person and there is stigma attached to that. So Chris Hindley, who is the designer in residence at the moment in the Design Museum in London, has been working with the postal service to create proxy addresses so that um, uh, homeless people can put an address which might be an empty building in some way, a non-used address, but that will mask where they're really living, but the post office will redirect it. And then finally, you know, systems change is already happening in homelessness in, in um, a number of different areas. So in Manchester, they've uh, co-designed with homeless people a charter which Lots of people, like the police, the local council, the health system, charities have all signed up to, to 
to end homelessness. And they're focusing on a number of different areas around employment, about standards for housing, um, about local services. And over in the US, in uh, Oregon, the Battle Creek Homeless Coalition have mapped the system and then want to, and agree to focus in on a few specific areas around raising visibility of the problem and therefore um, reducing stigma around ethical landlords and around making sure that there is enough uh, living wage jobs for people to do. So, when we're all doing our individual projects, how is it possible to keep a bigger sense of the system? First of all, to map and expose the system. Just doing this map and showing this to the councils we're working with has been really helpful in clarifying and reminding people where they sit. Identifying the root causes and feedback loops within the system, those are the places where you want to do your next project to really make sure that there's impact. Uh, work at different parts and levels of the system. You might start off working in a local authority area or local government, but actually change might need to happen at a national government level or the other way around. Um, open up your tools and insights to the system. We heard about open source um, in Australia earlier and actually Built for Zero in the US, which is a, a homelessness coalition, has opened up all of its uh, materials and data so that other people across the system can use it. Collaborate with others, we can't do this ourselves. And if we can't collaborate, then we can convene and agitate. We can create provocative ideas. We're designers that might uh, provoke action or stimulate change. So before I end, I just wanted to do another experiment. But this one time, you've been sat down all day, so I want you to get up off your seats. So um, who has, could you now stand up if you've done a project about homelessness? Okay, where was it? Where's that 3%? Um, oops. Right, now, have you done a project about resilience building? Or about mental health? Or about education? Or about employment? Or about boosting the economy? So we can see now we've got at least half the audience stood up. So my message to you all is that we can't do this all ourselves. Uh, we have to collaborate with each other. And together, we're bigger than the sum of our parts. Thank you very much.